The scripture reading today will be from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead, who went into a Samaritan village to get the things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and the disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever I go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. As I was getting ready this week for today, I couldn't help but think about my childhood when our family would have the newspaper with the comics and we'd pass them around. I'm sure you took turns passing the comics around with your family, laughing in different parts of the house and even coming to show your parents or your brother, hey, check this one out. Um, and I found a comic that really did resonate with me today, and that is, of course, Peanuts. I like Peanuts. In this one, we see that he goes to the local psychiatrist, Lucy, for help. And I'm going to turn around and see, look at it. He says, I'm in sad shape. Good morning, sir. Sit right down. Well, fine. I was afraid I might need an appointment. What can you do when you don't fit in? What can you do when life seems to be passing you by? Follow me. I, I want to show you something. See the horizon over there? See how big this world is? See how much room there is for everybody? Have you ever seen any other worlds? No. As far as you know, this is the only world there is, right? Right. There are no other worlds for you to live in, right? Right. You were born to live in this world, right? Right. Well, live in it then! And always the capitalist Five cents, please. I think it's important to understand that, you know, there's a lot of things we can dwell on. And it's good for us to know that we just need to move forward. We just need to live life. But I just don't want to tell you that today. That would be shallow. I want to talk about what it means to truly live. And we find the answer to this in Luke chapter 9. If you'll turn there with me, that's where we're at. Luke chapter 9, as we go along in the Gospel of Luke. We find ourselves in verse 51. We're going to finish up today, chapter 9, after several months. It's important to realize that as you study the Scriptures, there are times when you, like if you were to just do a daily devotional, you're missing out on context. And so we open this up today to read these two sections because while I could preach separately, I think that they do go well together. In today's reading, we have two sections. The first one deals with Samaritan opposition, and you see judgment and grace. The second one, you see the cost of following Jesus. Now, in the first one, we see Jesus has pointed his vision towards the Samaritan village, and he's preparing the way by using his apostles who go into town, except they look and they realize, because he was heading for Jerusalem, that they would reject him, that they would not welcome him. In fact, they had a situation where they had a stumbling block, and their stumbling block was bad blood between the Samaritans and the Jews. And that was enough to think that if he's going to go hang out with the Jews, we don't want any, any of that. And so you have James and John who react in a, a way that I think sometimes we identify with. The, um, the Gospel of Mark tells us that this is where James and John earned their name, Sons of Thunder, because Luke says 
that they say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Now, often we see people who reject Christ or we see people living in a certain way and, and there we tap into this James John, James John mentality and we're thinking, man, I wish I could call down fire from heaven. <laughs> but then we read that Jesus rebuked them. Amen. You know, he rebuked them. And so we turn from this idea of judgment and seeing Christ's grace and his rebuke of them, and we see within the following verses that we ourselves must reflect. We have to reflect on these three areas, these three scenarios in which the cost of Christ, of following Christ, is really mapped out for us. We see one man who wants to follow Jesus walks up to him and he says, you know, I'll go with you wherever you go to which Jesus sees his heart and he says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I know you think I'm going to go and I'm going to take over Jerusalem and be the king, but it's not going to be like that. In short, Jesus does not guarantee to those who follow him a life of luxury. In fact, he guarantees kind of a pilgrim's lifestyle. We see in the second scenario that Jesus actually tells a man to follow him. The man says, well, first let me go bury my father, to which Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, because you go, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury their own, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And so we see a situation here where this man, his father is dead, they're doing a funeral, and uh, I, some people think that maybe he's not dead, and, and the man is really telling Jesus, he's really old, he's about to die, I want to go with him until he dies, but that's all something we have to read into it. If we read it on its face value, the man's father's dead. And Jesus is asking him to sacrifice because in the Old Testament, you did, you took care of the funeral of your loved one, make sure it was correct and done before you did anything, before you read the Torah, before you sacrificed the lamb for Passover, before you worked in the temple. But here is the Son of God Himself saying to this man, you follow me. Let the dead bury the dead but you proclaim the kingdom of God. Whew. And there's a contrast here, isn't there? There is this idea of the dead. There is this idea of life. There's this idea that Jesus Christ, He teaches what it means to live. He gives us life and He shares with us how to share life. You Go proclaim the kingdom. Let the dead carry, care for them their own. In which we see the kingdom of God is more important than the worldly affairs of this life. And third and finally, we see a man that, that comes up to Jesus and says, I want to follow you, but first I want to tell my family goodbye. To this Jesus says, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And by the way, I don't know that Jesus rejected any of these fellows. He's just telling them what it means to follow him. I, I think it would be good for the man to go say goodbye so that he doesn't regret not saying goodbye because it's as if Jesus is saying, if you're following me, buddy, you're all in. You don't need to reg regret anything. You need to follow me. I require your heart. And so, when we take these sections side by side, when we see the Samaritans and how they reject Christ and, and how we are often like James and John seeking to call down judgment on others, but then in the next breath we see that we really need to judge ourselves and reflect on possibly our own hypocrisies. Are we afraid of being impoverished for the sake of the gospel? Are we afraid of missing things in this world 
for the sake of the gospel? Or even worse, are we afraid that if we follow Jesus, we will regret that decision? <laughs> when we look at Jesus' example, as he turns to Jerusalem, we see someone who is filled with resolve. We see someone who knows what will happen to him, who will die for us, who would not be looking for luxury, but rather he'd be taken away from those things, even though in his humanity he might have wanted that comfort as we all do. And yet he has no regrets. Why? Because he knows He's going to teach us, to show us what it means not to be dead, but to be alive in Him. We talked about this morning in our study of Philippians, the power of the resurrection and how that feeds into us. Oscar Wilde said that to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist and that is all. Think about that for a moment. To live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist and that is all. Most people, they eat and they breathe and they take care of themselves and just go about just maintaining, but not everyone truly lives. And if I take Oscar Wilde's quote, I can even change it a little bit because I know that Jesus said, narrow is the way, so I could say to follow Jesus is rare indeed. Most people live. And that is all. All people eat and breathe, but not all people follow Christ. Not all people follow the Good Shepherd who said, I have come that they may have life and that they would have it to the full, that they would truly live. To have life to the full, we must look to our Shepherd who calls us as His sheep to follow Him and ask, are we behaving like his sheep? <laughs> are we following him as we're supposed to? If we look in Luke chapter 9, here in the second scenario, we see essentially three lessons. First, we see Jesus respond to the heart of the man who wanted to follow him by saying, <laughs> if you follow me, you're really not going to have a place you can call home. And that's a problem in our world. That's something we are brought up with, innate within us, to have a home. But for us who follow Christ, it's deeper. We truly live. We can extend Jesus' application. You know, there might be people you know who are able to go to a movie and watch a movie every single day of the week. Maybe you're not able to afford to follow that kind of lifestyle. Maybe you have friends who, who travel all the time, who travel out of the country multiple times for months on end, and maybe you don't have that ability, and you just have to be content with the creation of God's expansive great plains. <laughs> you know, since 2018, the price... Of a gallon of milk has gone up. It was two dollars and ninety cents a gallon. Today it's four dollars and three cents. And I can tell you that that indicates a larger problem, and that problem indicates a problem, a burden, amongst people not only in this nation but all over the world. But understand what I'm about to say to you. If you are a follower of Christ, that's not what truly matters. What matters is who your eyes are on. To truly live is to keep your eyes on Him. No matter what happens, whether the economy goes bad, whether real estate goes bad, whatever it is, that becomes part of our testimony as we are contrasted to the rest of the world because we understand, we understand the price of salvation is infinite. And the consequences without it are immeasurable. Number two, we see in the second scenario that Jesus, the Son of God, calls someone. Like, like God who called Abraham to leave his family, so does Jesus call this man to leave one of the most important familial tasks of the time. 
Once again, this is another problem with our world. Another problem that they don't like about Jesus is that his priorities are a little bit different. And we can extend this funeral setting to anything that the world might deem to be more important than Jesus. And they've got a long list. I've noticed something that over the last 30 years, there's been a a change in the heart of kids and the generations that come. There, there tends to be this desire, almost an obsession, to, to, to make sure that there is a just system. And that can be bad and that can be good. It can be bad when it becomes obsessive to us and it becomes, makes us hyper-political, but it can be good if seeing what people are going through, you look to Jesus and that changes everything. In my children's generation, praise God, there's a large group growing who understands the need of Jesus. Do you know that? We often talk about this current generation, but I tell you what, there is a light, and that light is coming because of the Holy Spirit, and it is in these generations who look to Christ. I keep hearing these stories about friends who tell me that they know somebody who's a child who's growing up and who goes to church with mom and dad and is so invigorated by the Holy Spirit that, that they get to a point, praise God, where they're like, Whoa, I think I want to get into ministry. I think I want, to, I want to preach or I want to be in children's ministry or something. And all of a sudden their parents say, no. Not on my watch. Go back to reason one. Because you can't get the RV. You can't get the house. You're going to be on a six-figure income and it's going to be a lower one. You can't retire. You if you go into ministry, you won't have anything. And I'm not paying for your school if that's what you choose. This year I've heard of three scenarios like that. Whew. To be a parent who stands between the Son of God and that who He calls to follow. I pray for those kids. I pray for them that, that the Holy Spirit would haunt them and continue to reach out to them and pull them until finally, in love and respect and honor of their parents, they say, I love you, I honor you, I respect you, but the Lord is calling me. I guess I don't need the tuition paid by you. You see, to truly live is to realize that Jesus' calling is life itself. It's like breath to us. And that life is burning within us like a fire. And I, I tell you what, we really do need, and I hope you're praying for this, we really do need a generation of young kids growing up who are thinking about joining ministry so that those churches in the future will be like lights in the dark places of this country if it continues to go the path it's going. It's going to need those night lights, those stars in the sky. Now, the great thing is, not everybody's called in the same way, are we? While we are all called to follow Jesus, some become ministers, others counselors, teachers, administrators, educators of some kind, architects, mechanics, Curators at museums, doctors and nurses, I could go on and on and on. But the beauty of being Christian is that you don't have to be a preacher. You just have to follow. You just have to follow Jesus. Because that's what it means to live. Let the dead bury the dead. But you, in your life, in your hands and your feet, proclaim the gospel. Number three, we see that Jesus is approached by a man who wants to follow, but first he wants to say goodbye to his family. He wants to look back in that moment. <laughs> I'm reminded of Lot's wife. What'd she do, church? She looked back. What'd she turn into? Anybody know? Salt. 
powdery pillar of salt which today no longer exists, degraded into nothing but minerals which dissolved into water, turned into nothing. Why? Because she looked back. Because she regretted. Because she wanted to stay. And this is often a problem in the world full of distractions. And I know you are like myself. You find yourself having all these things that would distract you. And there's so many things that can make you think that you miss something, that you regret. In fact, you can start to live an entire life full of nothing but regrets. Live in the power of the resurrection and the hope before you. Christ said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What a powerful verse, especially if you realize this. You only got one. You only have one heart. And the world wants it to be divided up between all these little different things to slice it like pie. You ever gone Thanksgiving, had that pecan pie, ever try to cut it with those pecans and it just kind of smooshes out and goes everywhere? That's what it's like when you divide your heart up. You got one. If you give your heart up to all these things, all of a sudden you're not zealous for anything and regretting everything. To truly live is to realize that Jesus has your heart your full attention. Does he have yours? If we apply what is read here, we see that instead of judging others as James and John thought about doing in that moment, we should be thinking about ourselves and ask, are we truly following Christ? Are we truly living? Do we keep our eyes on him? Are we living according to the gospel, the, the life rather than the death? Do we give our heart to Him? And no matter how difficult things might get in the future, no matter how it goes in November, no matter what happens with Ukraine or China or, or what's going on in the United States, if you are in Christ, you truly live. If your stomach is empty, if you are in Christ, you truly live. If your bank account is empty, if you are in Christ, you truly live. When I was in high school, I was sure that I knew what it meant to truly live. You see, when I was 12 years old, I had a poster of Arnold Schwarzenegger on my wall from Terminator 2 sitting on that bike with that shotgun, those glasses. I thought that was cool. And across the bottom of that poster, it said $1 million because he was the highest paid actor at that time, $1 million dollars. For a single movie. That's nothing in comparison to today. But at that time, I thought, oh, that's what it means to truly live. And then when I got into high school, as I was beginning to really uh, get my chops into acting, I was thinking of myself like Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Man, these guys really know what it truly means to live. But then I realized something. You see, I had an idol, and it wasn't made of wood. It was made of flesh and bone. There I was. I was Adam and Eve and I was staring at the apple wanting that. Thinking I knew what it meant to truly live when I had no clue. I realized that if I did go down that path, I would never, ever have satisfaction. <laughs> and in fact, I would only ever be left wanting more. It's like when Christ talks to the woman at the well. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Are you thirsty? But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In them life so that they can give others life. 
So as the deer pants for the water, so does your soul pant for Christ. Christ.